is one step. Oh, geez. Completely different circumstances I got to deal with. That tree that I put my hand on, why is the bark moving? Oh, shit, it's alive. Those are millions, hundreds, thousands of caterpillars. Okay. The next step. Oh, completely new set of circumstances I got to deal with. What was that that just ran on the bark? Oh, my God, was that a gator? Wild hog, wild hog. Well, so everything is very intense early in the jungle. Three thousand miles from Texas, he paddled down the Amazon. A stranger in a foreign land, he felt alone on this river, the world's most famous, lined with legends and filled with fantastic beasts from his dreams. Piranhas, anacondas, jaguars, and just maybe a mermaid lie in wait. In fact, it was a dream that drew today's guest to one of the most remote rainforests on the planet and set him down nearly naked in a wooden canoe. Welcome to the Get Lost Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Sills, freelance journalist and explorer. Today's guest is a former waiter at the Catfish Station on 6th Street. Uh, He's crisscrossed America many times with a dog and a van and a leopard print couch in the back. (laughs) He's paddled down the Amazon and he's solo trekked across parts of Africa. He's now a professor at the University of Texas, the Minister of Culture for the City of Austin and the school. He's a self-described armchair anthropologist and an Academy Award-winning actor, Matthew McConaughey. Welcome to the show. Joe, I love the way you weaved all those factoids in there, man. I like that intro. Yeah, man, thanks. Hey, listen, all that is cool, but the thing that's got me most curious, um, being a guy from Memphis, you know, I know Beale Street pretty well. And I know 6th Street in Austin, so tell me about this Catfish Station, man. Catfish Station was an all-black blues bar on 6th Street. Um, And it was a joint that uh, I always ended up at uh, when we'd go out with my friends. Um, Yeah. Me and all my friends wouldn't go there initially, but I always ended up over there because love the music, love the smell, love the sweat, love the blues. And so... After, you know, I don't know, about the 10th time, 15th, 20th time, I ended up in there till it closed. I decided, I was like, well, I keep coming here. I need a job. Maybe why don't I ask for a job? And I asked the manager, his name was Lerone, for a job. And he, he just laughed at me. Um, and I would always sit on, on this, I would always lean just left of stage against the cooler where the beer was. One, because uh-huh. it was really hot in there and I had the cool air. Two, because whenever I wanted a beer, I could just kind of reach down and pull one up. Yeah. And he laughed at me and said, man, you crazy, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I was like, what? No, I do. He goes, man, if you really, you know what? You've had a few. Come back. Come back tomorrow night. If you still want to talk about a job, we'll talk about it. Well, I came back the next, next night, had a few beers. I said, I still want that job. He goes, okay. Gave me an address. Said, go down to this place, uh, you know, 930 in the morning next Tuesday and ask for Homer. All right. So, it seems legit, you know. This seems real legit. I'm gonna Are you go thinking you're getting the run around at this point or what? No, I'm I'm rolling with it. I knew that they were the success of this small catfish station where they were, which only held about 40 people and mm-hmm. had a band and had two bleacher sections mm-hmm. with a table in front of them. I knew they were doing well and they were moving to a larger spot on an address on 6th Street because uh-huh. the club was doing well. 
And I, my guess was that's where I was going to meet Homer. <laughs> right, right. So um, I show up down there about five minutes early, 925 on a Tuesday morning. I, 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 I open the door, right address. There's a guy, a uh, black man at the bar with his back to me. And then there's another really large black man, well over 300 pounds, mopping the floors. And I said, uh, uh, Homer, nobody moves. Mac man keeps mopping. The guy at the bar, the bar, I said, Homer Hill. And all of a sudden, the guy at the bar turns his head over his shoulder and goes, yeah, what you want? And I said, I, I mean, it's Matthew. Here to see you. And he goes, what for? I go, well, I talked to Lerone. The other oh. night, catfish, talking about a job. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, grab, a, grab a mop and go with Carl here, and y'all go clean up the men's room. All right, yeah, <laughs> naturally, right? Naturally. Well, Carl, without missing a beat, doesn't even look at me. Starts mo- grabs his mop and his bucket, points to another mop and bucket over on his way, and I just go get it and go roll on back. Here we go. Head off in the bathroom. We're mopping down the floors. About 10, 15 minutes later, I'm sweating now, wondering what the hell, man. This is not what I was talking about, but I, I think there might be something come out of this. I yeah. hear this, man, put that mop down. <laughs> and I turn around and hold to the door. And he says, you really want a job here? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, Thursday night, show up. Boom, I showed up Thursday night. There's one girl working, Tammy. She was the queen bee. I had known her because she had waited on me when I'd been there on my yeah. nights when I wasn't working there. Yeah, um, the Blues Club. She showed me the ropes. About two weeks later, a week later, I start. I take I take the floor. I'm, I've got half the floor and that one bleacher in Catfish Station. She's got the other half. Um, I was the only white and the only male to work there besides the besides the management. I bet and, you did great on tips, man. Ah, uh, did great on tips. I never beat Tammy. I never even got close to beating Tammy, man. Yeah, of course not. I got 72 bucks one night, and she was nervous. Uh-huh. She got, I think, 76 or 77. That's the closest I ever got to her. Well, look, you look in the tips in there. You know, who wants who wants the new white guy when you can have Tammy? No, I, I wouldn't want you to be my waiter. If I no. go into Captain Station, I don't, you don't look legit at all. Like, why are you even there? No, I'm sticking out. No one wants my side. But over the years, it turned out to where some people did want my side because they wanted McConaughey to go to wait on them. We ended up working for, in that small place for almost the next year. Then we moved to the big place and it ended up at one time, I believe it was me and 27 um, girls that were the wait staff. And all 27 girls were black and it was me. I was still the one white and the one male. Um, and I've stayed in touch with Tammy. She's doing great. I think she lives in Dallas. I've stayed in touch with Homer. Uh, Homer's still in town. Doesn't have the catfish station on 6th Street, but has a catfish station in East Austin. And right. stayed in touch with him. So if listeners want to go to East Austin, they can still go to Catfish Station. Yes, you can. Right on. Ask and- for Homer. Ask for Homer. He may send you the back with a mop, but ask for Homer. <laughs> hey, hey, hey what, what should they order there, man? That catfish, man. I mean, there's not, it's not a, not, a, not a long list. Do you just want to go there for the catfish? What about the and, sides? Uh, uh, your sides, you're going to get, I mean, get some beans and get some fries. It, it, it's basic, but it's good. Right on. Okay, cool. Well, hey, man, one of the reasons we want to have you on the show today is about your book, Green Lights. Um, I'll tell you how I got introduced to it because it's sort of crazy happenstance. I'm literally walking down the street. There's a little boutique bookstore on my street in downtown Memphis, and I see your face. And I'm like, well, that's weird. What's he doing? Looking all mystic into the, <laughs> you know, into the abyss. And so I walk in, I grab the last copy they have, and I read the whole damn thing in three days. All right. Man, I was blown away. And I think the reason it hit me is because, in my opinion, it's a travel book. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you set out to write a travel book or not, but what it is, is like this compilation of incredible events throughout your life that you somehow had the foresight to either write down or record. Yep. Yep. It did you happening. did you know when you were writing these journals and recording videotapes in your van that that was going to be a book one day? I didn't know, but I had, a, I had a hunch that I would be prudent and it was worthwhile to keep writing them down, that one day they might be worth sharing, that one day I might be able to look at them and find common denominators of the way I've gone through life, things that worked, things that didn't. Right. Um 
I had many that I forgot to write down. Many, you know, something great happens in our life, something turns us on. We know in the time, we believe in the time, oh, I don't need to record that. <laughs> I'll, how would I forget that? Right, well, I'll remember this forever. Which we don't. Mm-hmm. Or we lose certain details. It's like a good dream, you know? Oh man, how can I so good? I'll never forget that. Well, we do. Um, so I just had a pretty good discipline at writing things down. And whether it was a Sharpie on my arm, notes that I'd end up taking a picture of, a matchbox, a beer coaster, a napkin, or the recorder in Cosmo when I was recording on a cassette or writing in a journal. Um, and then I'd get, all of a sudden my desk would get full, my room would get full, and I'd find some time along the way to put those in a Ziploc and say, <laughs> you're going to go back and look at those one day. And that's three and a half years ago is when I decided, let's go open up all those, that treasure chest, all those journals and all those little notes in the Ziplocs um, and see what you got. And what was that like? When you, when you crack that seal on the Ziploc and you're back in your head, Decades ago, in some cases, what is that like? Um, sort of intimidating because I wasn't <laughs> sure if I was going to enjoy what I saw. Um, embarrassing sometimes. Um, even sometimes shake my head shameful. Um, mm-hmm. But then I, as I got into it, uh, I started. I think the first thing I started to notice was that. It was funnier than I thought. The stuff I thought I was going to be embarrassed about, a lot of it I laughed at myself. And I was like, <laughs> and maybe I was able to laugh myself because I go, oh, you've learned that lesson now. You yeah. have a good repeat offender, you know, right. or maybe some of the laughter was like, you're still repeat offending. You know what I mean? Um, some of the stuff that I felt shameful about, I was like, oh, you've forgiven yourself for that. Or, hey, now it's time to. Um, it was, I think the coolest thing is that the stuff I was writing down at 15 the, the, the subjects I was interested in, how the world works, what's my relationship in it, what's an idiosyncrasy of somebody that I found funny or made me happy, an idiosyncrasy of myself that that I thought was weird, uh, but uh, has been consistent trait of mine. Yeah. The same stuff I was interested in at 15, I'm still interested in at 50. Yeah. So, And the other thing was I, I noticed, you know, I always wrote things down, as we said, so I would not forget them. When I went back and looked, I was like, oh, you actually remembered more than you thought you'd forgotten. Yeah, it's sort of amazing to in the early part of the book, you're in your childhood and there's just shit in there that I would like building tree houses and stuff that I would have forgotten about in my youth because I know I've done that, not to the great degree of skill that you exhibited, clearly. <laughs> and that that's something I, I want you guys to go and check out in green lights. I'm not gonna tell the tree house story, but uh it is very, very, very cool. Um Tell me, what is a green light? A green light is an affirmation. A green light says go. A green mm-hmm. light says more, please. Yes, <laughs> double down, continue on, forward. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Lanya, let's go. Uh, it doesn't impede our way. I mean, that's a literal version of a green light on, tr- on, a, on, a, on a highway. Mm-hmm. Um. In life, though, this is where the title came from, the book. I noticed that there were certain ways that I engineered green lights in my life. I mean, we all love green lights. We want our life to be green lights. We want to move forward and just keep dancing through life, evolving and saying, man, I'm, I'm running into no resistance. Well, there has to be resistance to create green lights or hell, what are we doing in life? How do we evolve, right? Well, the resistance is the yellow and the red lights. That's right. And it's sort of just saying, hey. You get to a yellow light in life. You run into a problem. You run into a roadblock. You got to stop and pause. You got to have be introspective. You got to look over your shoulder and ask yourself why the hell you you keep you keep being a repeat offender of that that foible of yours. You know. Yeah, that's the same fun. thing. You need them. You need them to have a little because if you if life's nothing but green lights, we're just going in circles and we're not evolving at all, right? So a yellow light slows us down. A red light stops us in our tracks. That can be a real hardship. That can be death, sickness, um, uh, um, real loneliness. That can be a whole, that can be all kinds of things. But I found that some ways I engineered the green lights for myself. In many ways, I took certain responsibilities today, sacrifices today that gave me more freedom in my future, that gave me more green lights of freedom in my future. Can you give us an example of that? How to, uh, uh, early on, it's how to be a good friend. All right. Where I was a good friend and maybe stepped outside of myself to do something for somebody else that I knew they needed it as a friend, even though 
it was going to take up my time and I'd have rather been doing this other thing. Those friends came back later in life when I needed them or I noticed that they were out there on my behalf when I wasn't even around and they were helping pave ways of good nature and good word on me going forward, which opened up more opportunities and gave me more freedom. Choosing, um, you know, not to... Choosing at times little things, choosing at times not to gossip on someone else's behalf when they weren't there. Yeah, don't don't start no shit, won't be no shit, kind of. Well, you know, you could it it, it it may be a the person who usually is doing the gossiping on on somebody or on us or on us at a time, they may be the highlight in that moment. Yeah. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna talk shit on you to some people behind your back. They may all laugh when I'm talking shit on you right then, right? But then as soon as we walk away from that conversation, they're going, huh, if he talks shit on him, he might talk shit on me. I just lost yeah. respect for that guy. Now, I also walk away and I go, wait, what if they go and tell him that I was talking noise on him? Yeah, yeah. so now, you're paranoid. Now, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm building, I'm creating unnecessary yellow lights and stress in my future for the next time I'm in Memphis and run into you. Because I'm like, I did talk shit on him behind his back. I wonder if he knows. You know, I, I've lost an ally, a possible ally in the world. Yeah. So basically, I didn't create my, I may have got a green light in the moment by making everyone laugh at that party, but I didn't buy a green light in the future. I actually bought yellow and red lights in my future that, that were unnecessary. So lying, cheating, stealing times, I chose not to and sacrificed something where I was like, no, you know, green light, man. You go preparation. For a job interview, so you don't show up sweating, going, I'm completely, I don't, I'm so ill prepared for this. Yeah. Well, maybe Friday, when I chose not to prepare for Monday's interview, maybe I had a great time and I had a good fun time of drinks with my friends, and that was a green light in that moment. But boy, it sure is a hangover Monday morning when I'm not prepared for my Monday interview. Yeah. Now you show up on set with a script that's all in Spanish. Oh, and it's a monologue from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. There's so many funny stories in green lights that made me laugh, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about a red light. Cause yeah. this, this struck me, man. And I don't know if you know this, but um, I want to talk to you about your dad. So I lost my dad to COVID three months ago, almost to the day. Oh. Yeah. So when I read your book, uh, I'm laughing. I'm having a good time. And then I hit this moment where you're on set at Dazed and Confused and it's kind of your first big break and you're excited and you're sharing, you know, all this experience with your dad. And, and I think y'all were pretty close. And then then he's gone. Yeah. Is that a red light? Major red light. What was that experience like for you to balance this professional high with with the low of the moment well so i'm five days into working on my first acting gig i'm as high as i can be personally turned on as i've ever been in my life at that point i think i'm 21 mm -hmm. i feel like i'm doing something that i'm good at i have an innate ability to do people are telling me i'm good at it i'm getting paid 320 bucks a day i'm going wow this is as fun as I've ever had, and I'm getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. Then dad, boom, dies. Well, yeah, I mean, as much as that was personally a highlight in my life, having finding that, that, that job and being able to act, there was no question of, the, of which imp, what was had more import. I mean, my father passing away was like, okay, drop it. I'm out of here. I'm not asking permission. I know I'm supposed to work tonight. And tomorrow on the next day, but I'm out of here. I got to go home. And I really didn't, th I, I didn't think about the acting that I had. I mean, it was, it was, it was pain and loss and confusion. I, I didn't think my dad could be killed. Uh, I didn't, I thought he was the abominable snowman. I didn't think, I'd never considered him not being alive in this, in this life. He's a larger than life figure. Yeah. And he was a bear of a man who just had an immune system like a Viking. And, 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 and yeah, he lived life fully and lived it hard. But 
he wasn't close to leaving this world, not in my eyes. Um, and then all of a sudden, boom, he was gone. So it was out of the blue. Um, I went home, spent time with the family. We had many late nights on the kitchen. You know, death makes me so tired. It's still to this day. I go in a hospital, I get narcoleptic. I, 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 I really, and, and I, I would, we'd be talking about dad crying. I'd pass out on the, on the kitchen counter and mm-hmm. wake up and, can, and my mom, my mom and my two brothers would still be talking and then we could pick up the conversation. And, and uh, it's emotionally know. overwhelming really to absorb that energy. Yeah. It always has been um, to that extreme for me. Um, but we had a wake, which he wanted so friends came in from all over the country for his, his, his wake. I'm the 18 year, I'm the 21 year old, the youngest son, the idealist who held my father and what he taught me in such regard that in many ways, that's when I also on that weekend with the wake started to learn that lesson that we learn when we lose a parent that, oh, there's a difference between the message and the messenger. Yeah. There were some things that I was standing on testimony about because my dad said this and you're going to pay him back for this and you're going to pay my mom back while my brother's in the back going. Because he knows that actually, yeah, that guy may owe dad money, but dad owed him money and they had a deal on the side that, that I didn't know about. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that that on, you know, it comes to the surface, right? Yeah. When you have to wrap that up. Um, so you get back on set eventually and. Do you feel like you're sort of acting for him then? You're you're pushing forward for him in a way? Or is this self in a way, it, I'll, I'll say this. My, my heels were more firmly on the ground, and I think they were pretty firmly on the ground before he had, it, while I was acting anyway, as Wooderson, Days Confused. But now, you know, there's a, the, this is where the green light starts or a green light asset from a major red light like that. Now, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, which has now turned into a career for me, this thing I love to do, and I'm getting paid for it. I can make a living of this. I can supply something that the world demands, and I love it. And I'm getting, this is awesome. People are saying you're great at it. While that, be, that just five days prior had become the most important thing in my life, all of a sudden, it got put in second place. And there was no competition. The death of my father was of the most import. And what does that mean? The fact that that took so much import and now this great, uh, this great opportunity that I was now living through acting was number two. Yeah. Um, I'd say I became a better actor that day. That's interesting. And so just going through your life, there's so much that shocked me. Um, when you talk about having acting as number two and one of those, one of those things that shocked me was that you for a long time were living out of a van and you were traveling America. And this is after you've become a well-known person in society. So tell me about what that was like. I would, I had lived in, in, in Hollywood and for a little while I had, I was successful. Um, I still need to audition for some roles, but some, a lot of roles at that time were just blind offers to me for the success I had already had. Mm-hmm. And people knew what kind of work I would do, so I was getting some offers. So uh, without even having to audition for them. Um, but I, I remember feeling like, what is this deal with everyone? It feels like everyone, and this is true about Hollywood, and it's, uh, you don't notice it for a while, but you start to go, well, there's a lot of people that go to restaurants to see who's eating at the restaurant rather than going to the restaurant for what's on the menu to eat. <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of people that go places to see who's at that place. Right? And I was like, well, that's like, that's, that's almost overly aware. That's not, they're, 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 they're not, they're not really living in the first person. And so, and I'm not meeting, I'm at a time in my life where I'm not meeting any strangers. Meaning everybody kind of knows who my name, knows who I am, has a preconceived idea who I am. I was like, I just gotta, I want to go. I, I'm, I'm not see. I didn't feel like I was seeing true, true and honest behavior by just people, strangers. So, yeah. I love to drive. It's my favorite place to think. 
It's my play, favorite place for ideas. I love to, I love to explore the, 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 the country. Um, and I like to be able to change my backyard and it drops at, at, a, at a moment's notice. So it's just me and my dog. So we just hit it. And I said, this is what I was, a, that was my front row seat. That was my acting class. And just I, getting in a van and hitting the road and and hitting it and gone. and spending time with myself and other strangers if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, seeing, you know, I think part of it was when I got famous and anybody, any celebrity that gets some celebrity status, you're coming in now all, all of a sudden with some, oh, yeah, yes, come to the front of the line. Right, because right. Because you're Joe. You're Matthew. Come to the front of the line, yeah. please. I'm going to borrow social currency from you by moving you to the front of the line. Right. And I'm getting social currency. And I, and I remember questioning at the time. I was like, I appreciate the social currency. I appreciate the backstage passes. I appreciate getting led to the front row of the concert from behind the stage. Yeah. But can I still, do I still have the hustle to, to work my way? Uh-huh. to the front of the stage are you still do a I kid still from have, texas do I, still have the, do I still have the bs to bs my way to get backstage before yeah. i you know as john doe matthew mcconaughey before i was known and so i was really wanting to i was wanting to create some resistance for myself to go you need to go and you see it from the african trip to the amazon trip to even the touring around america in the van it was it was a lot about go where they don't know your name and see what you can get see if you can hustle yeah. See if you can hustle to get what you want. So what are you going to do if you get a flat tire and you don't have a AAA card or you don't have that OnStar to hit? What are you, what, what, what you going to do? Oh, geez, man, I don't know what I'm going to I hope it's not hot. I, I got the wrench. Where's that damn wrench? I wanted to just give myself those certain very base practical challenges that I would have to deal with. Uh, and on the road is where I found it. Plus, I got to see some of the great comedians of the world who didn't know they were comedians <laughs> you know things that trailer park life and people say they're all transient anyway so mm-hmm. we were sort of like sailors on the highways of america coming off the rivers which were the highways and that you port for a while you you dock and then you get up and you go and, and you don't have to say your name you don't have to show your id you don't have to do yeah. none of that you're in and, and i i liked being a little undercover but also just running into people that yeah thought it was cool that matthew mcconaughey was in the trailer park but maybe thought they were on Mars for a second. You know what I mean? Uh, that that would kind of freak me out, man. If I just rolled up in the uh, campground and you were chilling there, I'd be like, what the fuck is going on? I, I had a few of those, I had a few yeah. of those, yeah. But I'd say there is that camaraderie when you're on the road. And that's the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I'm like, well, this guy might be famous and all that, and that's cool. Uh, but also I feel like just another sailor on the highway, right? Well, that's what I mean by just keep living. I mean, I've always wanted to challenge, oh, I've got rights as a, as a person, as a, as a hell, as a mammal, as a citizen that yeah. came long before I had, was famous. And while I don't want to look down on any of those things that I get, it, well, that, well, because I'm famous, which I don't look down on them, I want to make sure that who's wagging who. I want to make sure that I'm still wagging this dog. I'm still to make sure that, hey, it's who I was and who I am that is, has large responsibility for why I became famous. Now, that goes both ways because there's yeah. a lot of opportunities I got and was in the right position at the right time and made, took advantage of them and got lucky along the way as well. But I was always like, let's make sure you're, it's who you are, Matthew, that is why you're going to have, got your fame or going to continue to be an artist or an actor. And you know what? Time. I think having read your book, not knowing you very well at all, but having read your book, I think a lot of that comes from your dad. You think so? I think because he seems like the most grounded ass dude, you know, and he was teaching you hard lessons like it's okay to get in trouble, but what's not okay is to lie about being in trouble. So that's the truth. That's who you are. Yes, I fucked up and stole a pizza. Yeah. That's okay that you stole a pizza, Matthew. What's not okay is you try to lie about stealing that pizza. Yeah. So as we move along in the show, I want to get into the meat and potatoes of the Get Lost podcast. And I want you to use a green light, one specific one from the book. And I want you to tell me how a guy with everything in the world 
ends up alone in the Amazon rainforest. Okay. Green light. This is a supernatural one. So, 1990, what is that, 96, I think. Yeah, 96. So, I've just done A Time to Kill, which mm -hmm. is where I became famous. That's the movie that made me, that like over the weekend, major uh, studio picture, did, does really well in the box office. That's when the world became a mirror to me. Right. Um, I'm feeling all this talk about it, to the front of the line. <laughs> yeah. All, everywhere. And I'm wow. Okay. Don't be clumsy with it. Appreciate it. But man, my feet aren't feeling very much on the ground. I'm, and, and I was looking for a sign, a reason. I felt like I needed to go away. I went to the monastery there for a while, but then I have this, this, this dream, 11 frames and I'm floating Naked down the Amazon River on my back, wrapped up in anacondas, pythons, there's piranhas, sharks, alligators, crocodiles, everything. And the left bank is lined with these African tribes with spears and shield and a shield. But it's an 11 second dream. It's 11 frames, like one frame, two frames, three frames, four. And on the 11th second, the 11th frame, I ejaculate. I have a wet <laughs> dream. That's crazy. Yeah. And here's the thing. I wake up. What the heck is that about? Uh -huh. But I know very particularly that I've had that dream once before in the exact with the same outcome. Uh -huh. So now I immediately go, wait a minute. I don't know of any other dream that I've ever had. Uh, wet dream or nightmare or whatever. That was exactly frame for frame. The exact same dream. Do you think it kept happening? So you would remember that dream? Well, it do it, it, it that, that's what I, how I took it. So when it happened twice, I go, well, wait a minute. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the context of that means. So much of it doesn't make sense. There's nothing sexual about it. There's no, there's nothing. There's not a, there's not another person. There's not a woman that I, well, yeah. what's it, what's it about? We're uh, assuming you don't have wet dreams about wildlife often. Oh, we're so, yes, this is my first, this yeah. is my first <laughs> wildlife <laughs> wet dream. Yes. With, 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 with no contact in the dream that, uh, that would make sense. Uh -huh. So because of all that, I go, this is so specific and so out there. This has got to be a sign. Somebody's telling me something. Uh -huh. God, my conscience, Jiminy Cricket, the prime mover, the way maker, something. And so I said to myself, all right, you got to listen to this. this you you got to follow through on this. If it's happened twice, that's not an at once. I remember when it happened, you kind of forgot about it. Now it happened twice. It took you right back that time. You got to do something. Yeah. And I said, okay, what are the two things I know in the dream? Amazon River and African tribesmen. So that gives me my first point of in direction. I right. go to the Atlas for Africa and I look for the Amazon River. As most of you <laughs> probably know, that's the wrong continent. Yeah. I look for two hours. I call my buddy Bendler. Dude, where's the Amazon River? He goes, wrong continent, buddy. I go, oh, but as dreams go, places and times don't always match up. Right. So I find the Amazon River. I said, I got to go down. I got to go. I think that's my first place. I got to go to the float the Amazon. I got to go see what this, what the next chapter of this dream is. So I get a one-way ticket to uh, uh, Lima mm -hmm. um, and traverse from there and make it to the Amazon. And that was about a 22 day trip. Yeah. And I mean, you kind of gloss over, like I got to the Amazon, but that in itself is kind of a big ass deal. Yes. Getting to the Amazon was hiking, boating, uh, floating, canoeing, uh, to get to it. Um, so and you're it, determined. It, you have to find out what this dream means. Well, I have to. And, I, and, and, like most all of my my trips away on, on my own, I don't know how it is for you and others, but, you know, it was a heady time for me. Like I said, I had just gotten famous the world. I'm trying to get balance to the world. I go off and I'm shaking, shaking monkeys off my back. I'm getting demons out of my head. I'm trying to decipher what's real, what's fiction, what's, 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 what's love, what's lust, all those things. And the first 10 days, 12 days on this trek, I'm not enjoying my company, me. Right. I'm having sleepless nights. I'm thinking about, you know, I'm 
foreshadowing too much. I'm thinking about, I'm actually thinking about when am I going to get to the damn Amazon to find out the answer? Yeah. And while I'm doing that, I'm missing a lot of the beauty that's on the trip, but it's a hard trip. It's a bloody trip. I'm sweating. It's hard to get there. And fatigue can be very good for clearing our mind. Yeah. Well, about day 13, that day night 12, I think it was, I decide I'm, 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 I'm completely sick of myself. I'm, I'm like wondering who the hell I am. And I start looking at all my talismans that I have and my American cap, my dad's ring, uh, my, this Irish uh, good luck charm, all these things that give me identity of where I've come from. Well, I decide I got to strip all those off and just say, no, let's strip it down to where you are the, the, at the most base, a mammal and a child of God. As a believer, I'll go that far. Yeah. And so, so you've got all these travel trinkets, like we all kind of tend to collect. Yep. And that you're give like, me identity and memory, and I guys shred them. I get rid of them. Now I'm completely naked and going. Now you're really alone. Forget your past and what you think has made you. Things you have pride. Things you have honor about. Forget them. And I'm in a tent. I'm in a tent, and I end up. Whether it was self-induced or whether it was just part of the trip, I get the, the, the what do you call it, the Montezuma Revenge. I purge. I'm, 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 I'm throwing up. I'm just coming out of both ends. I'm just, I'm, I'm having a purge. Uh-huh. Um, anyway, I wake up, I finally pass out, and I wake up like a couple hours later. And I feel great. I honestly feel like not only light in my head and spirit and body, I come out of the tent and I'm going to go for a hike. And I remember one of the, uh, Juan De Leos was his name, a guy. He was about 30 yards away. He was already up, quick picking up camp. And he saw me come out of the tent and he goes, Mateo, la luz, la luz. The light, the light. He's like, you're light, to lose, to lose, la luz and to lose, like you're light. And I was like, yeah, I am. He could just tell by my whole aura, the way I stood and everything, the way I uh-huh. moved. And I went for a, uh, a hike. And for the first time, I wasn't wondering what was around the bend. For the first time, I wasn't worried about, damn it, where's that Amazon River? I gotta get to the destination. What's that damn dream about? For the first time, I wasn't thinking about, you know, I gotta make something of this trip, or I gotta make something of my life, or I gotta figure out what all this fame's about. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just looking right down, enjoying each step. I think I had a couple of yerba mate tea walking with me. And I turned this muddy corner on this muddy trail and I stopped me in my tracks. There's this glowing blue, blue glowing floor of the jungle earth. It was, it was over the path and over the, over the edges of the path. It was about probably, I don't know, 12 yards by 12 yards. And it was just this pulsing blue on the ground in the middle of this jungle that had nothing but green and dark brown mud. And I stopped and I stared and I was like, what is that? And I start start to kind of move and start to bounce off the floor a little bit. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden it goes. It was tens of thousands of butterflies, all the exact same blue color. And I remember at that time going, I've never seen a blue like that because it looked plugged in. It looked fake to me. It looked man-made. It looked like, I remember, looked like what you call not green, but nitro green, not blue, but like plugged in electric blue. It didn't look man-made. And I, and I had saw that color in the jungle and I'm like going, oh my gosh, that's mother nature making those colors. And I remember in my head going, oh, all those sort of electric blue and hot pink colors you think that are man-made, <laughs> this is where they started. Mother nature, they ain't got nothing on mother nature's colors. And when they all fluttered away, I looked up past them And what did I see for the first time about, I don't know, 100 yards up there? The Amazon River. Saw the Amazon for the first time. For the first time I quit looking for it. The first time I quit chasing to get to my damn destination, to get the result, to figure out what was this all about. It appeared to me. And I didn't say, I said, thank you, is what I said. That's the only audible words I said. And I said them up to uh, um, Mother Nature, to God. I said, thank you. The lesson that I got there, I remember I remember writing, going back and writing in my journal, all I want is what I can see and all I can see is in front of me. That was, a, that was my little poem for that, what happened in that moment. I was like, ah, 
things came to you when you quit trying to look around what was around the bend. It was another lesson is what, what people would call being present. So I got present and then, then the gifts came to me. I went down to the Amazon. I floated in it. Um, I saw what seemed to be a mermaid. I And the rest of the trip was glorious. I got in a pirogue and I, I canoed that river. I got off with my machete and hacked my way through jungles. I had the time of my life. My mind was loose. I was writing. I was loving everything I saw. I had a wonderful time. And the rest of the trip was beautiful after that. And that's, the, that's one of the lessons that came to me from that moment. What is it like as you're in a pirogue and you're canoeing down the Amazon? What are you seeing and, and hearing and feeling? Well, the, the, the jungle is four-dimensional. All right. Mm -hmm. The Andes, which are the way on the way to the jungle, they're, they're a song. It's open air. They're, it's not four-dimensional. It's, it's much more two-dimensional. The jungle, though, is so intense because it's alive there, it's alive above you, it's alive to the left, and it's alive to the right. So I, I, I would call the jungle is every step is a new note if we're going to talk music. Yeah. Where the Andes is just like, whoa, a song. The jungle is one step. Oh, geez. Completely different circumstances I got to deal with. That tree that I put my hand on, why is the bark moving? Oh, shit, it's alive. Those are millions, hundreds, thousands of caterpillars. Okay. The next step. Oh, completely new set of circumstances I got to deal with. What was that that just ran out of the bark? Oh, my God. Was that a gator? A wild hog. Wild hog. What was so everything is very intense early in the jungle. Yeah. It, the jungle initiated me uh, where every single paddle was a whole new set of circumstances. What's going to drop out of that tree? What just swam up? We are a piranha here. I know there's anacondas here. There's alligators too. What about that kaniru fish? Wait a minute. What's up in the air? So very intense. Break a sweat. Get, get, get tired early. But with each day, it, after it initiates you, I started to become much more comfortable with the rhythms of the jungle, much less afraid of that sound over in the bush because I'm now becoming a mammal and part of it. And I'm larger, so I'm really probably not on the menu, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not looking to go swim at the alligators or anything, no. But I'm understanding yeah. things are just moving and I may be coming through quietly and so it may, it may disrupt something um, and cause movement, which on the first night would have scared the hell out of me. Now, night four, five, six, seven, I'm love that now I'm starting to hear the music and all the movement of the jungle and all the new circumstances with each with each step, with each paddle. Um, then I felt like I was on time with it. Then I felt like uh, I didn't feel like a predator, but I but I felt much more like I was much more aware of what was going on without again it it became a song to me, much less of a note by note. It became, I could hear the music of it. And uh, it's, you know, the jungle's alive at night and end of the day. The Amazon is alive, man. I mean, it's, 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 there's, <laughs> you reminded, I, and this, this has always humbled me and made me actually relax me in a way. You remind, to be reminded that I was part of the food chain. That's right. Part of the world. And there's jaguars. There's all kinds of, yeah. Not to mention uncontacted tribes that might. Yeah, you know, but I trusted in that. I felt like, you know, I always have always, even before I went to the jungle, but even more so after that first time on the Amazon, felt like that'd be the graceful, already pre-written way to go as part right. of food. Meaning nothing out there. I, there was relaxation in the fact that I, I would felt very secure that I wasn't going to be injured or killed off of a uh, a, a crime of passion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know I mean, and there's some relaxation that comes with. Okay, I'm not worried about the drive-by. <laughs> this is just like be smart, understand. Thankfully, it's the wet season. There's plenty of food. Don't make don't make don't make uh, uh, abrupt movements. If you do come across a tribe, hands up. International sign for I come in peace. You know, you're not bringing trouble. My energy was good. Just be aware. And because if you go here, it will be part of the food chain. And How many like, days do you think you were out in in the rainforest? Like while you're uh, actually on the river? That next probably 12, 10, 12 days. You know how many miles you might have covered? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. But what's important is what you found, right? A mermaid 
Yep, found a mermaid, saw her tail, or at least that's what it looked like to me. And then, um, I believe she's now my wife. And uh, I, think she's, I think she swam that day, started her swim uh, from the Amazon out the in the South America and curled around and headed, headed west and came up on the western banks of North America. Strutted up, dried herself off, strolled into Hollywood, and thankfully went to the same club I did one night back there about 15 years ago. <laughs> we met, and here we are. And did you know when you saw her that you'd, you'd seen her before? It didn't start with, I've seen her before. It started with, I didn't know she existed. I didn't know that there could be, I didn't know that she was alive on, on, on the earth. Uh, I didn't know that, 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 that there was that possibility that she, that there was someone like her, not someone like that, that she was, was on the earth. Um, and so if I look back and do the math, well, she wasn't, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of the, kind of, kind of the point that hit me right there. And then I was, ah, that's right. Cause she's not from the earth. Ah, <laughs> look who you found. Look who found you. Look who swam up Whoop! right back. And it was like, yep. Okay. There we go. So we're talking about your wife, uh, Camilla, to pronounce yeah. her name correctly. So, um, did you ever tell her the story about the mermaid? Yes. What'd she say? She just quietly nodded her head and goes, yeah. Wow. <laughs> She's either uh, super mysterious or she really is a mermaid man. <laughs> That's the way to play that for sure. Um, listen, Matthew, as we wind down here, uh, I want to kind of circle back to two things uh, solo travel yeah and journaling do people who aren't recording their experiences miss something later in life i think so i'm not saying that you must journal to get the most out of life but i'm saying that if you journal you will get a lot more out of it um if even for the present, what, what, what you get from it in the present when you journal is you get a new sense of awareness. You, by putting the word down, healthily objectifies the experience, which is your own subjective experience. Mm -hmm. The great thing is it's still Socratic. It's still between you and you, but now you've popped out and you're having a look at yeah what it is, how you feel, what you did, what just turned you on, what just made you feel pain or pleasure, what question you have. You become, so you have, now you have two different versions of awareness from it. It was just subjective mm -hmm. and it wasn't out there. I couldn't see it because it's in me. Well, now you write it down, you have a new mirror of the same situation, which is, I think is very, very healthy. Um, and great for one's personal awareness. Um, and then, Secondly, we don't, we don't write things down usually unless we're lost and confused. Right. And I, I've, I think it's really important for us to write things down when we feel like we are on it. When we feel like, yes, I am catching green lights right now. Life, the rhythm, I'm, I'm the music of life and me. We are in sync, man. We are rolling. What I'm putting out is coming back to me in reciprocity. I'm dancing through life. Well, write down everything down to what you eat, what you sleep, what you drink, who you see at those times. Because there's a science to what we do at those times when we're feeling. How much time, you know, where am I spiritually? Where am I mentally? Where's my heart? Where's my body? There's things we do that I know have helped me go back and recalibrate when I've been lost, I've been able to go back in my journals and go, look what you were doing when you were really feeling on time. Oh, you quit doing that. Oh, you took that for granted. Oh, you don't practice that anymore. Oh, you don't do that when you first get up in the morning. Hey, let's go yeah. back and start doing, create, let's reenact those habits again. And a lot of times it'll help me get back on the rail and all of a sudden, ah, now I'm in the flow again. 
you know, that's interesting. Um, I think finding yourself is really the point of the get lost podcast. You got to get lost to get found. So I'd encourage you guys to pick up green lights. It's available now. Uh, any bookseller you choose, maybe Matthew would be uh, kind enough to give us a few copies to, to give away. What do you think? All right. We should absolutely do that. And uh, one last thing, and this is just something funny that crossed my mind. Uh, you're a professor. You're out in the field still pretty often, I think. You're, does it ever occur to you that you're pretty much Indiana Jones? <laughs> <laughs> you know? No, but I sure as hell take that as a compliment. Uh, um, all right, you know, one of the fun things about writing the book is going back and going, oh, man, you've taken a lot of risk. You've done some really wild and fun and cool stuff. Um, and I guess I knew it, but putting it all down to see how I got here, I was like, all right, man, so far, if this is the first half, I'd say you're, 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 in the, you're in the black, you're in the asset section as far as trying to get what you can out of life. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, at the, at the same time, you know, I, I pulled off a lot of things that I didn't really know, ha- maybe it didn't have on paper or the, the education to pull off. I did, you know, the wrestling match. There's certain things where I said, like, I'm just going to find out. <laughs> oh, that's right. So there, there's, I don't want to give this away either, but this is hilarious. There's like a part in the book where you're in a wrestling match somewhere really remote and you don't know how to wrestle, but you, I guess you saw like WrestleMania one time. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, yeah, I was a, 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 a wrestling fan. I'd seen it on TV. <laughs> yeah. So, so you like in there and you just decide, well, I guess I'm gonna pull out the diamond cutter. Yeah. Well, it was, it was the Boston crab. It was one Boston of crab. <laughs> yeah. And damn if it didn't work. <laughs> but I didn't know if it was going to work. I, I had in high school, I had some bullies um, pick me up and they tried to, to put me in a trash can. And um, I pulled out some crap I'd seen on like Monday Nitro or something. <laughs> Freaked them out. They ran away. I, mean, I got off scot free. So that, that shit does work. Hey, sometimes if you really commit to just the posture. Yeah. Trust me, when I was over there in Africa and there were some folks and boys that wanted to take, wanted to wrestle me, and I would just go, Whoa! They backed up because they were like, whoa, Chuck Norris. Hell, I didn't know. I don't know how to do any, any karate or taekwondo. I just took the pose. Yeah. I was bluffing. That's awesome. All right, so everybody, you can read about that in Green Lights. Matthew McConaughey, thank you for joining us so much. Uh, I'd love to get to Austin one day and audit your class for a day. I'm just fascinated about how that works. The Get Lost Podcast is a production of Sold Outside Exploration Company. Connect with us on Instagram at Get Lost Podcasts. Tell your friends about the show.